our scripture reading and commentary, let's look again in Ezekiel chapter 8, and we'll finish up the reading that we started last time from verse 13 down to verse 18. We've seen how the Lord told Ezekiel to go dig in the wall, and this would have been through a vision. He didn't actually go back to Jerusalem. He's already in captivity up in Babylon. But in a vision, the Lord brought him back to show him all the abominations that were going on, particularly in the temple. And who was leading it but the religious leaders, the priests, the ones that had been placed there to direct the people to God in true worship, and yet they themselves were corrupt. It's an amazing thing when you look around even in our day and consider false religion. That all starts at the top. And people follow men rather than looking to the Word and reading what the Word has to say. But people still are accountable for what they do because this Word is there. People can read it, but they prefer, as one man said, why should I study the word? That's why we pay our preacher. Let him study and tell us. Well, that's, that's not how God has set it up. Yes, we need those that will lead the congregation in truth, but the word is what we're to consider and weigh, and not to consider men above the word, so that if they're preaching something contrary to the word, to speak up and ask, how is it that you say this? But here's what the word says. So here we find in Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 13, again, he's showing him why it is that he's going to bring destruction to that temple and also to the city. He said also unto me, verse 13, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do, as if what he had seen already was not abominable enough. Here we have holy God pulling back the curtain to reveal exactly what all is going on in uh, the name of God, and yet nothing but abomination. That's what idolatry is. It's an abomination of the holy God. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, would be a way to pronounce that. So when he says you'll see greater abominations here, even though Ezekiel had already seen idolatry outside the temple, because they had adapted the, and adopted the ways of the people around them, the nations around them, yet now he says here's a greater abomination and he says he brought me in the door of the gate of the Lord's house which was toward the north and behold, that word behold is something that catches your attention. This would be another way of saying to my dismay. There sat women weeping for Tammuz. This is actually the only mention in the Bible of this Tammuz. But here was an example of pagan worship that was going on inside of the temple itself, because that's where he is. He brought me to the door of the, of the gate of the Lord's house. That would be the temple, the courtyard. And here, within this courtyard, Ezekiel is dismayed to find there, actually in that holy place reserved for the priests, this Tammuz represented an immoral idolatry. A lot of the idolatry of the day had to do with promiscuity and with fornication. Temple prostitutes. This was something that was very prominent in Canaan, and people would go actually to the temple 
to seek out these temple prostitutes that they were taught that if they had a relation with one of these temple prostitutes that was the symbol of fertility, that they would be blessed. And so you had people coming, and here right in the temple then you had this going on. This was prominent in, in Canaan, and all we can say is that it was shameful practice, to put it simply. But now in verses 15 and 16, not only, so that's the first indictment of what he's showing Ezekiel. Second one here, verses 15 and 16, is concerning the priests. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee not, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. How deep does the depravity go? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And this isn't a place of worship. I've often said that there's more done in the name of worship as an abomination before holy God than any other place, even in brothels and bar rooms and other things that people consider to be dens of evil. We're talking about a place of worship here where the transgression is like a, a sewage overflowing and the Lord is taking the lid off to show exactly just what God sees. When we see people come to worship, we don't know what's in the heart. Everybody dresses up and looks pretty good, but what is in the heart that is an abomination of the Lord? Any, any form of false worship and false practice is the greatest evil you could ever know. So that's what the Lord's bringing forth here. He says, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. How does apostasy begin? By turning your back toward what God has established as his glory, which is a picture of the son, of his son. That's what the temple represented. And where were their faces? Their faces toward the east, and what? They worshiped the sun toward the east. Well, these would have been the priests. It says about 25 of them. Typically, there were 24 courses of priests plus the high priest that were established in 1 Chronicles 23, you can see that, for worship. So that's where you get 25 here. But every one of these priests was caught up with this false worship. Rather than carrying out their duties of bringing the sacrifices and presenting them before the Lord on behalf of the people, here they had turned their backs to the temple and were worshiping the sun. This fits what we read about there in Romans chapter 1, that men in their depravity would rather worship the creature rather than the creator. They'd rather worship the works of their hands than they would uh, worship how God has established true worship to be through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, alone. So you can see here, this is a contempt for God. When you turn your back on somebody, that's an, a contempt for God and doing according to their own devices. And so this is why God is bringing this indictment. And so in verses 17 and 18, here we see God then with reason prophesying again of the judgment that he would bring upon all of these abominations. I know people say today, well, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. No, you can't have the sinner without the sin. And all would be destroyed. Verse 17, it says, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. It's an interesting statement. Therefore will I also deal in my in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare 
neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. He's talking about their times of so-called worship, crying with a loud voice. Like we have people today, hallelujah, God be praised, all this noise going up. And yet they're not worshiping as God has ordained. We have to ask the same question today in verse 17. It's contemporary worship. That's what we have depicted here. People not following the way of worship that God has established. And boy, is that a popular term. Contemporary worship. Bring in the rock bands. Let's have something that's going to reach our current generation. And it's anything but the gospel. The Bible set aside particularly in the modern day versions that are being used. You go into a religious bookstore, there's a different version of the Bible for every single type of person that ever want to read it. And uh, they have abandoned long ago this word that we hold dear. They filled the land with violence. See, there's a, where you have a breakdown in the way of worship, you have a breakdown in social order itself. So I'm think about something here a minute. I've thought about this for years. All these televangelists going around and telling about how many people are getting saved. I mean, if you counted them up, there would be hundreds of millions, according to their numbers. Went to this yeah, a meeting, had so many people come forward, accepted Jesus, all this stuff going on. Where's the effect in society? We live in a a more wicked society today than ever has been. And yet, we don't have, we couldn't have a more religious society. That tells you something right there. But there's nothing new under the sun. This is the way it is as God is describing it here. Now, this is an unusual statement when it says there they put the branch to their nose. Some people read that to think of thumb in the nose of God. This is what he's perhaps referring to here, but here specifically, when there was a horrible stench somewhere, something had died and they weren't able to get rid of the, the smell, people would go out and cut a branch, cut the trees, and the leaves would have a certain scent to it, and they would actually literally put it up to their nose to help cut out the stench. And this is what we see God describing here, that what they're doing when he says they, they provoke to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. The stench of what God is going to bring upon them, even in the judgment, and the dead bodies that would come from this judgment, they would go out and look literally for something to cover the stench. But that's how God's saying he's going to Bring that judgment. We used to sing that little rhyme as kids, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, you know, tisk at a task that we all fall down. That's about the plague in London, if you ever stop and think about it. And everybody carried a little pocket posy that had a, a flower. And uh, when there were so many dead bodies, they would literally take it out and put it to their nose so as not to smell the stench. That's exactly what's being described here. Where the Lord is saying the stench is going to be such that every one of them is going to grab a branch and put it to their nose to try to cover up the, the stench. That's why I say, people say, well, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. Well, no, the sinner is the sin. And whenever any try to approach to God in any other way than through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that sacrifice accomplished their Calvary, they've turned their back on him, just like these priests. So beware, there are plenty of preachers and, and religious people out there that are popular with the people, <clears throat> but they're not pointing sinners to Christ. I'm thankful for a place we can come and read this word and have our hearts pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ alone and uh, know that apart from him, there's nothing but condemnation. <clears throat> Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. I pray for your blessing as we continue this time of worship. And I pray that we would be bowed before you with thankfulness because of your grace and mercy to sinners such as we are in Christ. And I pray that you would ever teach us through your word and draw us to yourself. Thank you.
praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's precious name, amen.